I'm the descendant of a slave merchant from Bristol and also the descendant of the slaves that he brought from Africa to work his own plantations. When I was in school, slavery was literally half of a page. 400 years of human trafficking, the ravaging of entire continents was reduced to half a page of text, which we read in about five minutes. That was it. And all I'm asking for as a descendant of a slave is just to interrogate that history. Edward Colston was a Bristol slave merchant. Colston was one of the biggest slave traders in Bristol. And about a generation after he dies, someone else comes on the scene. That guy is called Samuel Spann. And this guy was a Navy chief during the Seven Years' War, Britain versus France. He eventually becomes the master of the Society of Merchant Venturers. The Merchant Venturers were leading colonialists. They were the ones who pioneered the colonization of North America. They also petitioned Parliament to lift a monopoly given to the Royal African Company to trade in slaves. After Britain won the Seven Years' War, he was given an island called Union Island where my ancestors and my family still live. He was given this island as his personal fiefdom. He controlled all of the slaves on the island. He owned everything. And Span started to basically import more slaves over from Africa. He also named on the island two settlements, Ashton, and Clifton after place names in Bristol. My late grandmother has a home in Ashton, looking out to sea, and her auntie, she has her house in Clifton, also by the sea. So you can sort of imagine the scene 200 or whatever it was years ago. On that spot where those houses are now, they would have been seeing people coming in British Navy uniforms, coming onto the island. Slaves would have been in chains, being led up top road and bottom road, which we call them today, led down the hill in Clifton. The most disturbing thing about this is actually my family's also descended from Spans. But unlike his English family, who were given vast fortunes in inheritance, run into the millions, my family didn't receive anything, of course. So you have this guy, takes over this island, he passes it down the generations to his children, and they just go on pushing their weight around on this island as they see fit. They just basically exploited the people there and passed down the wealth for their own advantage. While my ancestors were being impoverished by the greed of slave merchants from Bristol, they were building palaces to education. Back in the 1960s, when African Caribbeans were trying to find jobs in Bristol, were trying to find places to live in Bristol, they were basically prevented, from example, working on the buses in Bristol. And so they started a boycott. This boycott was inspired in part by Rosa Parks, who we know refused to give up a seat on a bus in Alabama in the 1960s. And they basically did a boycott, which spread like wildfire through the city. And eventually the bus company were forced to renounce their color bar. And this boycott was a very important factor in the passing of the Race Relations Acts in the 1960s. And so you really see that direct action in places like Bristol really has a history. Fast forward to 1980, the discrimination against black communities, the over-policing of black communities under the SUS law, when they could just stop and search you under virtually no grounds, reached a fever pitch. And there was an uprising in Bristol, in St. Paul's again, in 1980. I think you can really draw a connection from slavery and from the racism that grew out of slavery to Bristol as a city as it is today, or at least when I was living there. My family on my mum's side are from this small island called Union Island. It's beautiful, it's a small place, but it does have this very troubled history. It's a place which, which continues to suffer to this day. Places like Union Island, after slavery, we weren't developed at all. Union Island got electricity in the 1970s. So these countries are, you know, are, are way behind when it comes to development. We had an example of how that really plays out a few weeks ago. Petrol station exploded, three people were seriously injured. There's no hospital on the island, so they had to fly people out from the island to neighboring islands. One of those people was flown all the way to Trinidad. That's hundreds of kilometers away. All of those people died. Had Union Island been developed in the same way that Britain develops the Isle of Man or, or it develops the Isle of Wight, then that wouldn't need to happen. So this really brings me to this understanding of reparations. The reparations is about trying to repair this damage, the material damage, the psychic damage, the, the intellectual damage, the damage that comes from trauma, the trauma of slavery. It really lives on. It's absolutely no surprise that the 10 countries in the world with the highest rates of homicide are former slave states. Places like Jamaica, places like Brazil, even places like South Africa, which had racial discrimination and apartheid, still has that violence at its core because of the violence of white supremacy and what it did. So reparations are really an opportunity to repair that damage as much as we can. We can't bring people's lives back. We can't bring back those bones that were dumped to the bottom of the Atlantic. But in the interest of justice, in the interest of accountability, reparations are crucially important.
I mean, look, I just want to remind you of something. Back in the 1830s, slave owners, the owners of human beings, the people who brutalized them, who raped them, who mistreated them, were given a payoff for having to lose their slave property when Britain abolished slavery. So why is it so difficult to consider that maybe the slaves, their descendants, who were brutalized, who live in countries that have that legacy of slavery, why is it so hard for us to just say, let's look at giving them some reparation. Let's at least talk about it in the interest of fairness. I can't sit here knowing what my ancestors went through and not demand some justice and accountability. I mean, what sort of person would I be? At this moment in time, as we talk about Black Lives Matter and reconciling history, that we also start to think about media outlets that offer some sort of alternative or some sort of antidote. Double Down News is one of those places. And I would really encourage you to support Double Down News. Join the future of journalism. Join Double Down News on Patreon.